Good morning. Welcome to the Studio Time with Deb, the online version. Today, we are going to be talking about stamping as a texture. And I, this week, for some reason, I really needed to hammer on something. I just needed to hammer. So I went in the studio and I started playing and I was playing around with a lot of different things. And then I went online and I saw this work that just intrigued me. And so then I went to my studio and I started hammering with a purpose, a specific <laughs> hammering. So I want to show you, uh, I'm going to go to slides right away and I'm going to screen share and go to slides. And here we go. Okay. So we all know what traditional stamping looks like. This is pretty much traditional stamping. This is um, letters, stamps made into little flowers. And I, th this person does a really good job, I think. Um, here's some rings, band rings, and some bracelets. But what I saw that intrigued me is this. This is a British woman. And um, what really intrigued me was this, the, the overall stamping and this, that it was used as a texture rather than as individual little um, pictures or, or even you know, using the, the stamp as is. You don't look at that and notice that it's an oval or a line. You notice that it's a texture. And so I, She's got some really beautiful work. These are all different pieces of hers. Um, I wasn't familiar with her before. So on this one, you can see how the texture goes one direction here and then the other direction across here. She also isn't real worried about keeping it super even. Also look at these, the three little dots. Up here, there's three little ovals. I just think these are really interesting pieces. What's her name, Deb? Down here, Leslie, Ain, Ann, McCallan. It looks like it's kombu. It does look like kombu. It, some of them to me look like they could be the Aura 22 painted on gold. I'm not sure. I think it's kombu. I haven't contacted her. Look at these, just two little dots, but it creates a really nice little texture more of the ovals. So there's a lot of ways to create texture and texture creates a lot of interest in our designs. But today we're going to be talking about stamping. And um, then I w started going through my slides. So in going through my slides, I realized I have a lot of people who do uh, texture on their pieces as they're stamping as texture and Deb Karish is a really good one. She does beautiful stuff. You can see this is linear. Um, this is, she's got lines. She's got things. These are interesting because this is stamped from behind, right? So that it makes it come out. Look at this one. This is just a little O's, a little circle, a little circle stamp. But again, it's done as an overall texture. And I've shown you this piece many times. I show you this piece for lots of things. These are really nice earrings. And you can see, again, the bottom, it's just a, a hammer. Well, it's a stamped texture, a chisel. This is a Connie Fox bracelet. And you can see this one, again, was from the back so that these dots poke out. Nice textures. So let's talk about tools. One thing that you need is a hammer because you got to hit the stamp with something, right? Now, a lot of you like to use a really lightweight little hammer. And the problem with a lightweight little hammer is that you have to put the muscle behind it, which means that 
when you finally bear down on that, you are hitting so hard and it's easy to miss and it's easy to hurt yourself. You are actually much better off with a heavier hammer and then you have to pick it up, but you almost let it drop. So I found uh, Harbor Freight, they have a two pound brass hammer. Amazon, if you um, search for copper and brass or copper slash brass hammers, you'll come up with a lot of different choices. Uh, you'll come up with one like this one on the right, that's copper faced hammer. They have one inch faces. I believe mine is about one and a half inch. So it's a little bit bigger. I think a two pound hammer is too heavy. It, it's too heavy for me. Um, I like about one, maybe one and a half pound hammer. You can use a lighter hammer if you are willing to put the muscle behind it and risk that. So just know that that's, um, it, I think it's harder to use a lighter hammer. Why copper and brass, you say? We use copper and brass because it won't damage the tools because the copper and brass is soft. The faces get messed up, but you don't really care. It's got a lot of nice weight behind it and it won't damage your stamping tool at all. It won't make it mushroom over. You know, you've seen the tools that people use and they're mushroomed over on the top. I don't think I took any pictures of that. That's really dangerous because that mushroomed over part, what happens with that is that that part is very, very, very brittle and it's fractured. So if you hit it wrong with a, with a hard hammer, those pieces can fly off. And if you're not wearing safety glasses, which most of us don't when we do stamping, uh, those can hit you in the eye. So you need to be sure that your tool is never mushroomed over on the top end. One way to keep it from doing that is to use a copper and brass hammer. Here's two more. These are both brass. Uh, the one on the left is the one that Pauline Warg sold at uh, Idlewild several years, and it is a lighter weight hammer. Um, for doing softer stamping, it's pretty good. For most stamping, I would use the heavier hammers. This is Tough Break. Uh, many of you are familiar with Tough Break. It's a material that's used industrially to put on the top and bottom of a piece of sheet metal if you have it in a bending break when you're bending it so that you don't scar the metal. This is, it comes in um, several thicknesses. There's two common ones that we use. Um, this is a thicker one and I'm gonna show you how we use it. This is optional. It's not really something that you have to have when you're doing stamping, but it's something that can add interest to pieces. Um, the, it comes in different widths as well. Um, I can talk to you about where to buy it if you are interested. You can get it from me. I buy it in 100 foot rolls. Um, so you can talk to me about that if you want it. So I'm gonna to talk to you about a couple other things before I continue with this. But one is the metal. The metal that you use needs to be clean. It needs to be annealed and it should be finished. If there's scratches and stuff in it, and you go ahead and do your stamping, then what's gonna happen is you have to try to sand the scratches out and then you're gonna sand your stamping out. So you need to be sure that your metal's in pretty good shape. The thickness of metal is also really important. If the metal is too thick, it's very difficult to make it displace. It's difficult to make it get out of the way. If the metal is too thin, there isn't any metal there to displace. So it's hard to do good stamping. I find that 24 to 18 gauge all works really well. And not saying that you can't use thinner or you can't use thicker, you definitely can, but it is gonna make a difference. So another thing to consider is that these days with silver at almost $25 an ounce, ouch, um, that you might wanna practice in red brass. And I recommend red brass because it acts more like silver as far as the way it moves and the way it'll look and the way it behaves. So the one caveat to that is that you must use the same gauge in red brass that you plan to use in silver. Otherwise, if you practice in, in um, 18 gauge red brass and then you're using 24 gauge silver, it is not gonna behave the same. It's not gonna look the same. And then there are stamps. So there's a lot of commercial ones available. You can find them all over the place. Um, you can, there's several Facebook groups where there's stamps available. 
You can also make your own and it's not that hard to make them. And I'm going to show you, that's what I'm going to talk about in a lot of this is making your own stamps and making them really interesting. So I like to make my own stamps. I like to make things that are not commercially available. Um, I like to make things that are mine, that, that just, it's my design. And so, but <laughs> that being said, I don't like working in steel. I don't like annealing it and tempering it and going through all that mess. So I don't do that. So what I do is that I take things that are already hard, uh, like pieces of file, old files that are no good, and I grind them. I grind away to make what I want. The thing you have to be careful about when you're doing that is that you cannot overheat the tool. If you overheat the tool, you've annealed it, and then you do have to go in and temper it. Um, I don't want to do that, and I don't want to mess with that. So uh, I'm a lazy tool maker. So what I do is I'm sure to keep it cool as I'm working it, and I work down tools that are already hard to start with. And um, I just, I grind into it what I want it to be and then polish it up. One, the, the first thing I want to talk to you about is the length of the tool. I find that anything longer than a three inch tool is too long. And the reason that being too long is a problem is that you've got this big tall tool sticking up in the air and you're trying to aim a hammer on it. Well, that is really tough. Um, sometimes you miss. If the tool is shorter, it's much easier to see what's going on and to hit the end of it consistently and just to position it. Um, long tools are, are a little bit difficult. So because these tools are hardened, uh, I, need to cut, uh, well, I need to cut them down. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Another note just to think about as you're making these is that larger stamps are harder to make, they're harder to use, they need a lot more pressure and a lot more accuracy to stamp them well. So the, you'll see as the slides progress that the smaller tools do a really beautiful job and especially of the texturing that we're talking about today. So these are some stamps I made and I've shown you these before as well. These are some old files. The one on the left is a triangular file. It's a great big fat file. And because it's a triangular file, it's one of those big, it's not a needle file. We're talking a great big, um, a big fat industrial triangular file. Because it's a big fat file, I'm able to get that uh, a big curve out of it because there's a lot of material there. The one on the right is a little bit smaller. I think I got it. Oh, nope. I'll show you these. So this one is a much more gentle curve. I'll show you these again later but a much more gentle curve. And that one I made out of a flat file. All right. So this is some, oh, this is the, uh, the gentle one right here. Now, one thing I want you to note somewhere along the line, and I don't know where, I got a little nick in here and you can see it. Look at this. Every stamp has a little nick in it. See that? Now I could use that to my advantage. There's no reason I can't come in here and nick this all the way across. And then I would have little bubbles all the way across every line that I stamp. But you need to know that you need to check these and be sure that your line is pristine if that's what you want. This one is just a plain chisel, just straight out of the package plain chisel. And it also makes a beautiful texture. This is a, the, the slightly curved one. This is, I believe, a different one. But again, you can see that it makes a beautiful texture just if you do stamping overall. You can also line them up, you know, use a Sharpie marker, line them up really carefully so that you're getting a nice texture on there. I kind of like the randomness of this. This is a pin punch set from Harbor Freight. It's really cheap. I don't know, it's five bucks or 10, under 10 for sure. And you can see it's got different size ends on it here. So it goes from really fat to really little. These are longer than three inches, but they're okay. I don't cut them down. Um, I wish they were a little shorter. Maybe someday if I have nothing better to do, I'll cut them down and make them three inches. But for now, they're fine. But what I can do with these 
is I can use them, so I can use just the, just as is, especially if they're the smaller ones. What I wanna do is to polish the end of these. So when I'm looking at these, this is one that's been polished. And what I do to polish it is, since it's already flat, I don't have to flatten it. If I needed to flatten it, I'd probably take it to a belt sander. Um, but since I don't need to flatten this one, they're already nice and flat. What I do is I start well, it depends on how bad the end is. Sometimes they're really bad because they're not designed to do what we're gonna be doing with them, right? So if they're really bad, then I'll start with a separating disc. And what I do with the separating disc is I use it like a mini um, uh, disc sander. And I just put the piece up to it and I sand it on the side of it. Now, you need to be really careful when you're doing this. That is not how separating discs were meant to be used. You need to wear safety glasses and you need to use the thicker discs, not the thin discs, because the thin discs will not put up with this. But the thicker discs, you can put your tool up to it. You can get all of the really nasty tool marks out. Then I use a sanding disc, one of those flexible sanding discs. I'll sand with that. I'll sand with a sanding stick and then I'll use a white wheel and then a black wheel and clean it all up. After that, once I'm to this point, I can take some, um, stone wheels and I can grind a shape in there if I want to make it a shape. I can texture it. Uh, so if I texture it, I'm going to go at it with stone wheels or with separating discs or with diamond burrs. And do remember that whatever finish I leave on there is the finish that I will get on the, the silver or the metal every time I stamp with it. So if I want a satin finish, there's no reason that I can't leave a file finish on this. And then every time I stamp, I'll have a file finish in the indent. If I want a high polish in the indent, then what I'm gonna do is I'll take it all the way to the black wheel. If that's not enough, I'll go to the blue wheel. Usually black is fine for steel. But remember too, that a lot of these, and especially these Harbor Freight ones, I'll show you a slide later. Uh, sometimes their steel is really questionable quality. And I have one where the steel is very pitted. And what ended up is that I have little bubbles inside each one. It's actually really cool, but it was not what I thought I was gonna get. So any flaws that are in the metal, you're also dealing with and you need to think about and look at carefully. So this is actually when it was partway done. You can see I have it partway sanded here, not all the way. And then out, I haven't gotten to the edge yet. And this is what it looks like. They look like new. You can kind of see how rough that is. So this is one that after I polished it, I took a separating disc to, and I just cut lines. I cut lines across uh, one direction and then across the other direction. They're not super deep. And this was a copper piece that I was trying it out on just to see what it would look like. And this is a silver piece that I did just to play with it. Now with this, what I was doing was turning the, um, the stamp every, every strike, I would turn it a little bit so that I'd get this kind of random pattern. This is two pieces of rectangular wire and the one on the left, it's with the same stamp. The one on the left, I turned the stamp every time I stamped it. The one on the right, I tried to keep them kind of in order, but not really. But you can see how radically different the two looks are, even though it's exactly the same stamp. And I think both of them are really interesting and kind of fun to play with. Um, if I wanted the one on the right to be lined up even better so that they really were in straight lines, perfectly straight lines, I could do that. What I would probably do is to take my stamping tool, my stamp, and I would grind a flat in it. And I would grind a flat on the side of it uh, where I would hold my thumb in order to keep that straight, to keep it in line with the metal. There's a better look at them. I think those are both really cool. They'd look good on sheet too. This is another one. This is another pin, uh, pin punch. And what I did with this one was to use diamond burrs and I just ground little holes in them. And again, this is a bra or copper sheet that I use or copper strip that I use just to test it. 
And this is what it looks like on silver. So the one down below, the part down at the bottom, uh, I did, I overlapped and did kind of randomly. The one at the top, I left a little bit more space between. This is a hex key. So I don't know about you, but one of the things I have done is I've ordered some chairs and I've ordered some uh, just different things what, during the pandemic. I, I had to order two different computer desks to get this computer thing going right at the right level. They all come with these hex keys that you have to put it together with and then throw them away. Well, I save those hex keys. And I saved, I, I've been saving them forever and um, I've got a bag of them. And so I decided to use some of these and show you that we can make stamps out of these because they make some really cool stamps. So the first thing I did was to take my jeweler's saw to see if I could saw through this. If I can saw through it with a jeweler's saw, that tells me a couple of things. One is the steel is not very hard and I can still use it to make a stamp, but if I use it to make a stamp, I need to understand that because the steel is not very hard, that over time that stamp is going to get distorted or bent or mushroom over or have all sorts of other issues. So one way to test if the steel is hard enough is to try to saw it with a jeweler's saw. If you try to saw it with a jeweler's saw and it just skates, this one didn't just skate, it started to saw, but it didn't saw very well and it didn't saw very fast. And in short order, see my saw, saw blade? See how it bends like that? That means it was dull. And that happened in about four strokes. So if it happens in about four strokes and your saw blade loses its teeth and it's dull like that, that means the steel is relatively hard. It may not be super hard, but it's relatively hard. So that tells me that I'm not gonna cut it with a jeweler's saw. Um, so what I'm going to do instead is that I'm going to take a separating disc and I'm going to go through this with a separating disc. Now you can see my finger braced on the bench pin. That's important. Again, wearing safety glasses when I'm doing this and notice that it's a thicker of the separating discs, not the thinner ones. So, and the reason for that is that I'm going to go fairly deep in here. What I don't want to do is to try to go straight through from one side. What I want to do is to go around, all the way around, all the way around a little bit more, all the way around a little bit more. And I keep doing that until there's just a little bit in the middle. Now, then I'm going to try to break it off. This was too much. I couldn't break it off. So then I took it back and I did more until there was less. And then I could break it off. Okay. The separating disc will break more easily the further the deeper you have it into the material which is why we don't just go in from one side and try to do the whole thing that way you're guaranteed of breaking them pretty much so this way what happens is that i will go in a little bit all the way around and that works a lot better so what i'm going to do then is now i'm looking at the other end because the other end is the one i'm going to use the uh, make the stamp out of Okay, the end I cut off is the end that I'm going to um, hammer on. So yeah, I'm not even worried about refining it very much unless it's really bad. If it's really bad, I'll do a rough sand on it, but I'm not worried about it very much. This end I want to refine a little bit more. Question? Yes. Um, what, what do you hold the hex key with when you are uh, using the separating disc so you don't burn your hand? <laughs> Well, steel doesn't conduct heat nearly as well as silver does. So I hold it in my hand for a while, but, but it did indeed get hot, Kathy. So I think that's Kathy. So uh, I used my blue handled um, uh, wood jawed vice, Rio vice things that I love. And I held it in that. Got those. Thank yeah, you. The ring clamp also. Ring clamp will work fine. Okay. Yeah, but those things were really handy because I could adjust it really easily. So then I dress the end and it's the same way that I explained before. I would use the separating disc and then the sanding disc and or a sanding stick. Um, and then I would go in with whatever polishing that I want to do. So on this one, what I did was to, and you can see, I just left it kind of sanded here. I didn't, I left kind of a rough finish and I left it in its hex form 
And this is what I got. It printed mostly roundish, not so much hex, um, because the hex was up a little further. Uh, but you can see the sanding marks in it. You can see that I can still, it's still sanding marks. This is not the best slide, but what I want to show you in this is right here is where, this is a big one, I tried to print just on, um, on a bench block. And on this one, I put the tough break underneath the metal so that when I was stamping, I was stamping down into that tough break. And what it does is that it makes the indentation go further down. Yep, there's the tough break. And this is from the back side. So from the back side, here, you, it's up here. You can barely see anything at all, right? And that's the one where it was stamped directly on the metal. And notice directly on the metal on my bench pin, my bench pin is beat up something fierce. So my bench pin has a texture all its own that you're going to get on the back. If you don't want that, you need to work on a cleaner bench block uh, or cleaner anvil. This, the embossing, is what you get when you use the tough break underneath it. Um, so you can, and then you can use either side for it, which is really interesting. One thing yeah. I, yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you put the, you're, so you're actually hitting through the tough break onto the metal? No, the, it, the metal, um, so I have the anvil on the bottom, the tough break in the middle, and the, the um, metal on top. Okay, so it goes underneath the metal. Into the tough break. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I did not address under tools was the bench block that you need to be using. So an anvil works great, a bench pin, a bench block, any steel, good hard steel block works well. The one thing that I do want to tell you, though, is that if you have, especially if you have a long workbench, you do not want to work in the middle of your workbench. You want to move that bench block or bench pin or anvil to where it's over the table leg or over a support so that because if you work in the middle, what's happening is a lot of your work is going to go into bouncing that table. And we don't want to bounce the table. We want to stamp the metal. So you need to move that, um, that bench block or whatever it is so it has really good support underneath it. So this is a larger hex key. And this is the one I had a lot of trouble stamping into. This one is probably an eighth of an inch across. And I just had a lot of trouble getting a good stamp. I could not stamp it at all on metal. It did nothing, even with a two pound hammer. The one that what you're looking at behind here was stamped using the tough break behind it. That's the only way I could get a stamp to, to stamp properly with this one this big. Tough break again. So this is one of the, um, the hex keys that I ground into an oval. And I just did that with the um, uh, stone wheels and, and refined it a little bit. And then the top piece of metal that you see is Crazy 8 wire. So I went down and stamped the Crazy 8 wire. And then the bottom piece is a piece of sheet. Do note right here, I don't know what I got underneath there, but it was residue from something. It was dirt or, I don't know, some sort of booger across there and it printed. So you do need to be a little bit careful about where, you know, what, what you've got, and what's going on. I don't know what, it could have been the metal was dirty because it's just scrap. So then I started looking around for what else looked interesting and I found this, I have a whole bunch of these and I, I never use them. I, the, I, my sons, if they see this, are probably cringing, but uh, this is one of those things you snap into your screwdriver or snap into your drill bit or whatever, I don't know. Anyway, so, or into your drill, but it's a, a Phillips screwdriver tip. Now this is too short. Um, I used it anyway, I didn't care, but because it's, it is, it, that's how it came, right? Um, what am I gonna do, extend it? Um, so what I did, well, first of all, I looked at the tip, the tip is nasty, right? Because they're not really concerned that much about the tip. So the first thing I did was to sand it off and make it nice and flat. And then what I did was to go in, you can see up here, with a separating disc, and I exaggerated the X. I went in and made those sharper. 
And this is the stamps that I got, which I think are really nice. This one shows you really well that little dot that's on the file that I had. So this is a sheet that has um, the file, the chisel, the screwdriver part, the uh, pin, pin punch that I carved into. This is a center punch, one of the really cheap center punches that's just kind of a little pointed on the end. And what I did was to round it ever so slightly. I made it not so sharp. And then this is just a piece of square wire. And because it's square wire, it prints pretty deeply, number one. But number two, when I'm off, it prints really deeply, which I think can be interesting. I think that's fine. And if, if you don't think that's fine, then all you need to do is line it up a little bit better than I lined it up. <laughs> so I wasn't being real careful. Uh, this is on a piece of rectangular wire. And again, the same center punch. This down here is done directly on the metal. This up here is done with using the tough break underneath. And you can see how this is rippled. And I'll show you the back side. Look at the back side. So this one has the texture of my really ugly bench pin, but this one has embossing. So here's all of it together. But here's something else I want to show you. So this is the embossed side. This is the side of the square wire, which also looks very interesting. So if I wanted to solder this square wire on something, it could be that the side of it has the dots in it and the front of it has this um, bulging parts that I think are really cute. This is another center punch. And all I did on this one was flatten it. I could also use a pin punch for this. There's no reason I had to do this. Um, it's just I had some around and that's what I chose to do. So I just flattened it. This is one that I flattened and then I used a diamond ball burr and put a hole in the middle. So now I make these little donut shapes. This is a um, chisel and punch set from Harbor Freight. And it's just, a, it's a relatively cheap set. I don't remember, $15 maybe, something like that. Got a lot of different sizes of things, a lot of different tips, a lot of different, they're way too long. I cut them off and sometimes I can make two or three tools out of each one. This is one I'm using pretty much as is. I did dress the end, but I didn't change anything else about it. I didn't, um, I didn't cut it off. I didn't, I just did it as is. And you can see the, that's a low dome wire on the bottom and then a, a scrap sheet on the top. So you can see the, I think that scrap sheet texture is gorgeous. Could be really nice. That's it again. This is one, so this was a round one and I made it square. Uh, well, or at least close to square. It's not actually real square. I wasn't worried about it being real square. I just wanted it kind of mostly sort of square. So what I did was to just take the round one and I took my uh, stone wheel and I just ground off the round parts that weren't square. Um, this is, became a very small stamp. This is probably a millimeter across. It's a very little stamp. But I love this little texture. I think this is really fun. This is another set. This is a much more expensive set. This is from um, Amazon and it's a chisel set. This is also a more expensive set. The more expensive sets are nicer steel. Uh, they're going to hold up a little longer. They're not going to bend as easily. On one of the really little pin uh, punch ones from Harbor Freight, I bent the tool in short order. So this is some different tools that I made with them. Some of them I left the way they were. Some of them I rounded. Some of them I softened. Some of them I made into ovals. Some I, um, this one, I filed at an angle. So it's really narrow here and it's really wide up here. Really wide, probably half a millimeter. 
Um, and down here it goes to nothing. But when it stamps, you can see that. Look, it's wide down here and then it goes to really narrow. See how it does that? That's not from me angling the stamp. That's from me that I, I took the stamp and uh, shaped it the way I wanted it. So here are some more that I did minimal amounts to. Uh, very, very little. This one is a kind of a triangular shape. It makes this stamp right here. This one is the one here on the end. Some of these are chisels that I softened. Some of them I cut back quite a ways. This is a softened one. This is a round one that I made a little bit oval. This is the one I was talking about. This was really poor quality steel. And look at these little bubbles. And you can see them. They're, I mean, they're pretty obvious, right? So one of the things I was thinking of, and I ran out of time to do, is that if I find some really low quality steel that makes little bubbles like that, maybe I will intentionally make stamps that make little bubbles like that. I think that's kind of cute. So this is that little triangular one. What I did was to take a, a chisel, I made it triangular, and then I narrowed it a whole lot. So I made it really little. This is probably, um, I would say, two millimeters by one millimeter at the top maybe a millimeter and a half at the back side. And then I just did some stamping. This stamping is on 22 gauge and I did it directly on the sheet metal. This is, or, I'm sorry, directly on the bench block. This does not have tough break behind it. And you can see how deep I can get this because it's a tiny stamp and because I was using a relatively heavy hammer, I can get that texture in there and it is, I, it's gorgeous. So this is the, tr the trapezoid looking one. This is the square one that I had. I don't know if you can see the end of this very well. It was hard. It's hard to hold all that and photograph at the same time. <laughs> there you can see it a little bit better. But I think for an overall texture, that is really interesting. Could be really fun. This is another one. I just made it into kind of a little rounded square. And that is the end of the slides. So, um, I do have something else to introduce to you real quick. Hang on. Okay. And, and yeah. Can I just ask, when you talk about a stone wheel to do your grinding, are uh -huh. you about is that a Mizzy wheel type or I'm sorry I don't know which yeah Mizzy wheel is a brand name and uh, Mizzy wheel is fine and you can use a Mizzy wheel um, it doesn't have to be a Mizzy wheel though they're called heatless wheels often mm -hmm. and um, they're called that because the wheel doesn't heat up your metal will get hotter than hell so don't think that because they call it heatless that you're not going to burn yourself if you're holding your metal you will okay so, um, but the, the wheel doesn't get hot, which is great. I mean, uh, uh, but yeah, they come in different widths. They come in different diameters. They come in, some of them come in shapes. They come in all kinds of things. Uh, the Dremel kits usually come with them. Um, any of those will work. The key is to not overheat your steel because once you overheat your steel, then what happens is you're going to have to um, temper it again because you've made it soft. Okay, so, but any of those stone wheels, any of those grinding wheels, you could also use a sanding disc if that works better for you. Will you go over the conditions for tempering? Oh, I can, but I'm not very good at that because I don't like doing it and I don't do it very often. Um, yeah, but you know what, let me do it in another one where I can check and make sure that I'm telling you the truth. I don't okay. want to tell you something and have it be wrong. So let me, um, let me, I'll, I'll do that in a after class next week, or maybe as part of the class next week, we'll see. Okay. Deb, if you do find your uh, uh, stamp getting hot as you're working on it, can you just dip it in water to try and keep it cool? Yeah, I mean, if you're holding on to it, then it's not gonna get so hot that it's gonna get annealed. You have to get it red. It has right. to be red hot. And oh, okay. so the, the problem is if you're holding on to it with one of the clamps or like a ring clamp or 
um, the Rio clamp or something like that, sometimes you don't notice how hot that tip is getting until it is red hot. Um, okay. and, and so that's too hot. If it's just a little bit hot and you're trying to hold on to it, yeah, dip it in water. Now, steel will rust, right? So you don't want to, you want to dry it off when you're done. You want to be sure that it's not wet once you're done, then all is well. Okay. One other thing on the tuck rake, do you use it always or do you use it with thinner metal to make more of an imprint? So you can use it with thinner metal to do embossing. It works really well with thinner metal. And then you can use it even with the thicker metal if you want to do the embossing and stuff. I don't use it very often. I use it almost exclusively when I want to do the embossing. But that one large stamp that I had, um, it's actually right here. Let me find it. Well, maybe it's right here. Yes. This one. I made this from a hex key and you can kind of see, you can see in my hand that it's got a big face to it, right? I could not get this one to stamp if I just did it plain in the metal. It was trying to displace too much metal. I had to have tough break under this, under the metal in order for this stamp to work. Okay, thanks. So for larger stamps, for thinner metal, um, the tough break works well. You can use, there's the thicker piece and thinner piece. There's two different thicknesses that I have. Um, and it works well for that. I don't use it often. I don't use it much, but for some things, it's really good. Deb, Other questions? Deb mm -hmm. for that one stamp that you said was really large approximately, what's the diameter of that? I would say it's almost three sixteenths of an inch across. Oh, okay. I was it's just wondering for just to get a, a feel of what's what's big. Yeah, it's big. Okay. Um, I have a question. And you know, the thing is to try them, right? Because I tried that. I thought if I used my two pound hammer and I wailed on this thing, I can get it to stamp. I could not get it to stamp. So that told me that I have to use the tough break or something underneath it, or make a smaller stamp. It was just, it was trying to displace too much metal and I couldn't make it happen. I have a question. Uh-huh. Um, which I put on chat because I'm too shy, but I'll ask you. I love patterning Mokume and I do a lot of stamp patterning. And I wonder how these stamps might work if some are, would be better than others for using them. And then also with the tough break, would that help me get more texture on that backside, which is the side I'm gonna be filing off? The tough break would help you, absolutely. As far as what stamps are good and which ones aren't, I am not your person. Um, I've, there's no reason that you can't use these and you can try them out. You should talk to Anne, Anne can help you. Of course. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she's the expert, she knows these things. Um, so yeah, she's your person to talk to. There is no reason that you can't use these though. Absolutely. Um, they, they would be wonderful for that. And the tough break absolutely will give you more depth. Now, whether it'll give you too much depth or not, I don't know. Um, it might, but maybe not. So I, it, it's definitely worth a try and the tough break could help with that a lot. What's the source for finding that in addition to you? Because I know you said uh, that you buy it by great quantities. Well, the company that I order it from, I think only sells it in, I think it's only 100 foot rolls. They might sell it in 50 foot rolls. You can get it from, um, there's places on Etsy and other places that'll sell it, but I'm cheaper. <laughs> so you can get it from me too. But yeah. just, it's T-U-F-F-B-R-A-K-E. Deb, what about the separating discs? How do I, who do I buy them from? I get mine from Rio for the most part. You can get them from a hardware store. The ones from the hardware store are usually pretty thick and pretty industrial. Um, the, I get them from Rio and they come in all sorts of different materials and different, um, th there's the ultra thin ones that we use when we're making tabs for stone settings. The ones that I used for this are the ones that are kind of reddish colored. I forget what they're made of, but they're the kind of reddish colored ones and they're a little bit thicker. So they don't tend to break as easily. 
um, and they they don't wear down as quickly and they go through the steel just fine. Thank you. So going through a hex key, I broke a couple of them, um, but that's not, or going through two hex keys, that's not too bad. So this week, <laughs> I got a package from a very dear friend. Many of you know Charity, Charity Hall. She sent me a package. She is just such a sweetheart. She had a really good online sale, by the way. I hope some of you got some of her really amazing jewelry. But as a result of her package, I got an assistant and I want you to meet him. Hi, my name is Harry. I thought I'd say hi to you. I may join class occasionally. Nice. Bye. That's Harry. And Harry may join us occasionally. Charity sent one to Tom McCarthy, one to Christy Glick, and one to me. And so now we have assistants because we need assistants in our class. So I thought you'd enjoy meeting Harry. Okay, guys. Thank you for joining me today on Studio Time with Deb, the online version. Um, I'll see you next week.